From city streets to farms, mobility is finding new paths every day. I'm pleased to welcome on stage Jaheel Oliver, CEO of Hello Tractor. He is being joined by The Hill's Editor-in-Chief, Bob Kusak. Bob, take it away. Thanks, Jaheel, for joining us. I know Thank you. you won't, we'll get into it, but you, you had a long commute. Um, <laughs> can you describe uh, what Hello Tractor is, first of all? Yeah, sure. So we're we're agricultural technology company. Uh, as the name suggests, we work in mechanization, agricultural mechanization. Uh, we started this company in sub-Saharan Africa because farmers across the region lack both the labor and equipment that they need to cultivate the land that they have access to. Okay. And this means they plant late, they undercultivate, and they lose income. And so farmers are, are, are typically, uh, they, they, they solve this labor gap um, through, through mechanization, but in, in Africa, one of the least mechanized regions on earth, the tractors just don't exist. So we came into the market with a technology solution that protects tractor owners, protects their assets, and connects those tractor owners to the farmers that, um, that benefit from these services. Mm -hmm. And you live in Nairobi. I live in Nairobi. And you are from Cleveland. I am from Went Cleveland. to Cornell. Yes, go Browns. <laughs> um, one and two, it's an, it's an improvement <laughs> over last year. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a Jets fan, so I got worse. You, you beat, you pay, you beat us. Um, so, uh, but how in the world did you come up with this idea? You're only yeah. 33 years old. Thank you, Bob. Yes. That was warm, and <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm, I'm 37. Oh, 37. Yeah. Oh. Um, but 33 is fine. I go 33. Um, <laughs> we, uh, so I started this, I, I started my career in banking and finance here in the U.S. Okay. Wanted to do work that was more meaningful. Uh, transition into uh, working in the emerging markets, specifically in microfinance, okay. um, structuring deals for these banks that serve low-income populations. And what I noticed is their portfolio of, of borrowers were oftentimes farmers, but there were no agricultural products, no agricultural loans to support them. And I just thought that was odd. So that led me down a career of exploring how to support low-income populations in similar markets, in the emerging markets, um, with business models that can, can scale commercially, because I always thought that was an important um, cornerstone of, of any business. It should make money. Mm -hmm. And so that's what ultimately led to Hello Tractor. Uh, started the business five years ago in Nigeria, lived in Nigeria for, for a little over two years. Uh, and then as we grew, we decided to open an East Africa office to have coverage in that part of the continent, as well as the work that we're now doing in South Asia. Some have called your company Uber for the farm. Is that fair? I would say the other way around. I would say that Uber is not. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's fair. Um, but imagine a world where there were no cars on the road and you first had to build technology to get car owners comfortable all right, with investing in these assets, and then stage two is figuring out ways to optimize the linkage between the car owner and the, the, the rider. Okay. And th that's the reality that we live in. Um, Nigeria, for instance, has um, six tractors roughly per 100 square kilometers of farmland, right? The global average is 200. So Nigeria has six, the global average is 200. There are no tractors. And so we started with technology to make it attractive to invest in tractors so you can avoid fraud through our applications. You know exactly where your tractor is, how much work it completed, fuel consumption, maintenance needs of the tractor, what the operator is doing with the tractor. And then the bookings come in, coming in so you can earn that revenue servicing the farmers who need the, the tractor services. And it's a win-win on both sides, right? The farmers are more productive. They save money up front, mm -hmm. and they yield more on the back end. Um, and of course, the tractor owner has a great business opportunity delivering these services. But how does it work as far as, is, I mean, is it, 
is it through the use of technology? Mm -hmm. uh, did you have to advertise? I mean, yeah. this was a totally new idea. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's why you know the the Uber comparison is is convenient, but it's very different um, fundamentally. The the technology starts with uh, we have a GPS monitoring device with sensors that fits onto the tractors, okay. right? Our customers buy that device, fit it onto the tractor, and then they download our application to manage the tractor, right? There's a separate application used by farmers and booking agents who oftentimes represent the farmers. And they identify pockets of farmers who have demands for tractor services in the same vicinity at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's important because the booking agent plays this vital role of aggregating demand so the bookings come in at economies of scale, right? Because these are tiny plots, right? If you know emerging market agriculture is dominated by smallholder farmers. And so by aggregating demand, it becomes profitable for a tractor owner to drive 20, 30 kilometers down the road to deliver services to not just one, you know, one hectare farmer, but maybe 40, 50 uh, one hectare farmers. Mm -hmm. And it becomes profitable that way. What were some of the obstacles when you started the business? Well, what did you learn, basically? Well, you know, the, the biggest learning was Listen to your customer, which might seem obvious, but for me it wasn't. <laughs> My wife says I has a, a small ego. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, there's, you know, when we cre when I created the business, I created the business, did a lot of desk research, you know, reached out to all the experts at the land grant universities, um, worked closely with professors at Cornell, but then also uh, the private sector. John Deere, who is now our biggest customer. Uh, and they all had their opinion on what was going to work. And I brought those opinions with me, and I was married to those opinions. And I kept banging my head up against the wall, trying to make something work that really just made no sense. And my customers were telling me the whole time, like, this is, this is what we want. Like, why well, you keep you keep trying to sell me this, you know? You know, and so um, that was the biggest learnings. I would say the biggest challenge was when we started in Nigeria, Nigeria slipped into a recession, the biggest recession that it's seen in, in 60, 70 years, and credit markets contracted, the Naira devalued against the dollar, and that just slowed down the economy to a, to a grinding halt, and that was, that was obviously challenging for the business, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and also out of our control. Um, right. So that, but it, it conditioned us to very different from technology startups here in the U.S. that are defined by uh, maybe a little careless spending. It forced us to tighten our belts. Um, we cut all unnecessary expenses. We knew that we would have to weather this storm because we were facing these macroeconomic challenges and these headwinds. And now that's in the DNA of the company. And we, we, we heavily invest in technology, we heavily invest in talent, but there are no beer Fridays, there are no ping pong tables in our office. <laughs> <laughs> You're no fun. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> right, right. You, now you sound like my wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> how many employees do you have now? It's 22 of us. Okay. Yep. Um, when, as far as like, we were talking about regulations before, mm -hmm. uh, what is, what was the atmosphere as far as working with state officials or yeah. uh, regulators? Is, what, what's the situation over there? Well, it's difficult. You know, there's a lot of fragmentation in our market. Uh, when we were working in Nigeria, of course, Nigeria um, has its challenges from a public sector perspective, and, and we all know about that, that narrative. But I think as we, as we started to grow, we're now in 13 markets, as we started to grow, you know, when you, for example, when you ship, ship GPS monitoring devices into a country, you have to get certifications, right? Okay. Now, every country has their own certifications. There's no one window approach like you would see in the EU or NAFTA, uh, and, and that's something that challenges our markets, not just for, for companies like Hello Tra Tractor, but also you know, financial services. I mean, all industries could benefit from a more unified regulatory approach. And I think it, 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 causes, it forces us to spend a lot of money and time in areas that don't add much value in the marketplace. Um, and you know, I think there's some, some some healthy discussions on how to solve those issues, um, but you know that's a that's a long, slow process. Well, what is what are some of the key differences between like, running a business in the United States and, and Nigeria and Nairobi? Um, well, I would I would say that um, the U.S. is is obviously a well capitalized market, 
So you have um, the luxury of trying a lot of things, uh, failing a lot, figuring things out. You know, the motto, everybody knows fail fast, is the motto of technology companies. We don't have those luxuries, so we have to be very smart about what we do. Uh, we, don't, we can't fail fast. You fail once, you're done. You're dead in the water, actually. And so um, we just have to be a little more thoughtful. But I also think uh, we're, not, we're not in this sprint against a million other companies sprouting up trying to do what, what Hello Tractor does. Right. And so because of that, uh, we don't have to raise as much capital, right? Uh, because we're not trying to outpace the next guy who just got a big soft bank investment. Um, and that helps a lot. So we protect our balance sheet quite a bit. Um, so I would say those are some, some very, very key differences. What about this model? Would it work in other parts of the world as far as expansion? Yeah, I mean, we have, um, as I was mentioning, you know, through some of our manufacturing partners, um, we're beginning to work further upstream, selling our technology at the factory level, having that technology fitted onto tractors as they come off the production line, and those tractors are being shipped all over the world. Now, we still are confronted with those regulatory constraints. In fact, I just got my, my hand slapped just a few days ago by uh, one of our biggest customers where some devices, some tractors with devices got shipped out to countries where we didn't have our certifications. Mm -hmm. Right, and so um, the, the the technology scales sometimes faster than the regulatory frames frameworks will allow, mm -hmm. and and we have to stay in front of that and be a bit more disciplined about how we manage that within the supply chain. Are you able to? You say this is a, a win-win for your business and, mm -hmm. and the communities you serve, but are you able? To, uh, have you been able to quantify the economic impact? Hello, tractor to, to local communities. Yeah, I mean, well, at the individual farm level, um, tractor services on our platform are about one third the cost of manual labor. All right, so there's significant upfront savings. For farmers that mechanize across the production cycle, meaning they do the land prep, seeding, fertilizer application, chemical, crop care, and harvesting on the platform, you're looking at an improvement in yields of 7x. So think, so think about this from, uh, from an environmental perspective. You can get 7x the yield without opening up new land, mm -hmm. right? So you're protecting the environment. Um, you can also, we're now introducing even conservation agriculture implements on the platform where instead of doing that deep disc plow, I'm a nerd out on agriculture for a second, but uh, mm -hmm. instead of doing that deep disc plow that completely disrupts soil fertility and that environment, that world that lives beneath us that we're not aware of with grubs and worms. And um, we do what's called strip tillage where you only uh, plow exactly where you need it. You drop the seed there and you keep everything else in place, the soil structure. Um, and that maintains the soil health for the long run to protect our environment and also to protect long term those farmers' interests. <laughs> Uh, why don't we open up for questions? We've got a, a few minutes left. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And if you can keep uh, the questions short so we can get in uh, two or three, that would be that would be fantastic. And just identify where you're from would be good as well. Thank you, Daniela Camrath, Washington D.C. I talked to some farmers in Transylvania, Romania, the other week and they mentioned that because they want to preserve biodiversity mm -hmm. they um, they don't encourage farming on big plots so there are farms like you said with small plots um, but they also have a problem they don't find people that know how to drive the tractors yeah are you in that business then how did you choose nigeria and also how did you find him this is fascinating <laughs> well, you can thank our events team. I, I was, I was listening. I didn't know anything about Hello Tractor. I'm like, this is an amazing story. So uh, they, they, they tracked him down and, and they got him here. And, and as you were saying, it was a 15-hour flight from Nairobi to, to yeah. New York. But I'll, I'll let you handle the first couple of questions. So we, um, we actually work with, when we sell technology, we work with the dealers that sell the technology to ensure that the operators get trained. Right, and the tractor owners and their operators get trained on how to use the machinery. So when you're a farmer, and we, we, and we save that information, we actually store it on the blockchain. If you all care about tech and you want to nerd out on tech, we can do that. 
um, and we make recommendations. So if you're a farmer and let's say you're growing, let me say sugar beet, right? That might be an important crop for you guys, right, in Transylvania. And you want an operator that's familiar with sugar beet. Uh, you want somebody who has logged the most hours, right, on that crop. And you also want somebody who has their training certifications for that crop. And right, and what, of course. <laughs> Can you get my tractor for over the Atlantic? <laughs> and so, um, so we, we make those recommendations as the booking comes in, we'll tell the tractor owner, you know, Pete is, is the best operator to send out on this job because he, his profile will traditionally has done better with this profile of farmer. And so we make that recommendation for them. Um, but training is a, is a big part of that. How we got to Nigeria, Nigeria has the largest inventory of uncult uncultivated farmland globally. Uh, it's a highly food insecure nation. And there was a ton of upside. And we also made a bet, and I think this was probably one of our better decisions as a company, that uh, the visibility and exposure that you get from being the only game in town in a market that is so strategically important for our global food security Will, will allow us to pull in partnerships, Fortune, Fortune 50 companies actually, um, because they don't have boots on the ground. And, and they didn't, and that's our competitive advantage, is the moat that allows us to compete and maintain our competitive position in the marketplace. Um, simply, we were able to attract um, smart people and myself to a place like Nigeria to figure out a problem and build solutions around that problem and make a market for companies like, you know, John Deere or I IBM. We, we partner with them on the technology side and various other, other players. You want to? Yeah, no, uh, question up here. We got a, we got a few minutes left. Scalability? Yeah. Okay. In Africa, Nigeria, in South Africa, are, yeah. you know, unique samples. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the, there's so much pent up demand on the, on the farmer side of our business. And we, we operate in this double sided market where you have farmers who need services, and then you have the supply of tractors that have to deliver those services, right? There, there's a lifetime of work on the farmer side, right? I think our biggest challenge has always been how do you get more investment into this capital equipment? Because it, you know, a tractor is anywhere from twenty to forty, fifty thousand dollars for just a seventy-five horsepower tractor, which is not the kind of huge tractors you see in the Midwest, right? And so um, we spend a lot of time figuring out how to unlock more capital to buy more equipment. Um, we, we're building tools for banks now to better understand risk when lending, uh, making these asset financing loans um, to, to crowd in more investment. But I would say the scaling challenges really reside on the supply side of the market. There's endless demand of farmers who are willing and able to pay. And I'm talking about smallholder farmers, right, um, for these services. What's the, the hardest part of your job now that you've got the, the business up and running, you're in contact with Fortune 50 companies? What, what's yeah. the hardest part day to day? Um, I think it's, it's keeping up with uh, a lot of the opportunities that get thrown our way now. It's difficult for a small company to say no mm -hmm. to a fortune, and I don't say no to anything, right? Hence why I'm here. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I was just joking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And we, we, and that's, that's how, we how him, you. Right. He always exactly. says yes. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, Andrew, when he reached out, I was like, I was like, okay, cool, I'll go because I like the hill. Right, right, right. right. I appreciate yeah. it. And uh, then I'm like, no, nah, I'm not flying to DC. But then somebody, the Unga stuff came up. They're like, we want you to come to Unga. I was like, all right. And then you're in the neighborhood, basically. Exactly. Um, 
But yeah, so I think the hardest part is just keeping pace with the growth of the market. People are excited about it. They see collaborative consumption, new economy models as a pathway to scale the equipment sales in emerging markets dominated by smallholder producers. And, and everybody wants to sell more iron, right? And right. so they come to us and we say, sure, we'll do that. And then we realize, wait, we, don't, we only have, you know, we got 13 engineers on staff. We, we're not ready for this. Last question, how'd you come up with the name? My Ellen wife, Tractor. my wife. Everything good that has ever happened in my life, okay? She's the smart one. <laughs> she is the smart one, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and I wish I was just joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's well. It's a pretty good name. It gets right. Yeah, there. I mean, we actually she came up with it here in D.C. We we're on U Street, and because that's D.C. is kind of home for us in the U.S. And I had some corny, just extra whack name, and she's like, nah. And she started kind of doing her little. Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> and then she spit out hello. Very simple, straightforward. What yeah. a fascinating company, Jahil. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, uh, Thank Jahil. Thanks for, for joining us this, this afternoon. You.